Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this Chinese mission that you might have already heard about, that seems to have a part of it, or a piece of it, tumbling down to planet Earth uncontrollably. And it might fall on some country somewhere out there sometime tomorrow, or probably have already done so when you're watching this video. But more importantly, I wanted to discuss why this mission is somewhat fascinating, and also what China is really trying to accomplish here. So what exactly is happening? Well, we know that China launched this beautiful Long March 5 rocket not so long ago, trying to deliver a piece of its new space station. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. This was a successful launch on April 29th, and generally this is where we would stop the story because it's only a part one of a seven part mission. But the thing is, the way that China launched this mission is very similar to how the Soviet Union used to launch their missions in the past, not very responsibly. Now, generally, when a rocket launch happens, the engineers here make sure that all of the pieces return to Earth really safely. Like, for example, for SpaceX, we know that the first stage is able to land back on Earth safely by itself, but with some other rockets, those pieces usually fall in the remote areas where there's usually no one, whereas the last stage of the rocket is normally allowed to fall somewhere in the ocean, typically in remote locations near the Pacific or sometimes Indian Oceans. Like, for example, in case of SpaceX, they normally target their second stage, which is the upper part of the rocket, to at some point start losing altitude and aim for the target somewhere in the area right here in the Indian Ocean, not so far from Australia. And because they've done this so many times already, it normally happens without any incidents. But we know that there was at least one case, specifically back in the 70s, when a malfunctioning Soviet satellite, specifically a nuclear satellite, broke down, could not control itself, and tumbled down crashing in northern Canada. Which resulted in a $6 million worth of a cleanup, and after this, Canada actually built Soviet Union, eventually recovering at least $3 million in damages. Interestingly enough, this was near an area known as Yellowknife, and I used to work there, and there are still stories about this today, including some really cool art that the locals made over the years. Here's just one of the pieces that was retrieved back in the 70s. Now, the thing about this is that since then, well, most of the re-entries were usually controlled. And typically today, when the rocket engineers try to build rockets, they make sure that all of the pieces normally end up in the so-called satellite graveyard. And is basically located in a very, very remote region in the Pacific. And that's generally what a lot of countries today and a lot of different um, space agencies tend to sort of do, mostly because this is kind of an, an established unspoken rule. But that's not really the case with China. As a matter of fact, China already has one case when something crashed somewhere in Africa from one of their previous missions, but this was a much smaller piece. This time, this entire chunk, which is known as the core of the rocket, that's roughly around 30 meters long and about 18 tons in mass, is basically tumbling down uncontrollably, and at the moment, nobody knows where it's going to crash. Now, first of all, I'm posting several websites in the description that allow you to visually imagine or technically calculate where the piece is located right now and where it potentially will crash in the future. Now, currently, the prediction is for the satellite to re-enter sometime on May 9th, Eastern Standard Time. And if you were watching this in the future, chances are you already know where it crashed. But interestingly, if you look at the motion of the satellite, it sort of does pass through a lot of regions populated by people, including actually the place where I live. And so there is actually a slight chance that the core of this rocket might actually end up crashing over a region where people do live, and China in that case is going to be responsible financially for all of the damages incurred. The question is, of course, are they going to pay? And on top of this, there's a chance for a slight political incident, depending on where this lands. But that's not really the main point of the video. The point is the mission itself. Why are they doing this? Why are they taking these risks? And what exactly is being planned here? Well, they're building a space station. And not just a tiny space station, they're actually building a modular space station, what would be known as the Generation 3 or Tier 3 space station. The one that you can actually upgrade and the one that you can attach pieces to, kind of similar to obviously International Space Station. Now, the final product is supposed to look something like this, and this is known as the Tiangong Space Station. And the piece that was just launched successfully into orbit is this right here, known as Tianhe, which is the core right here. And that's just the first piece 
Now, we don't really know much about this space station, mostly because China does not reveal these details uh, beforehand, but we know that it's going to be about one-fifth of the mass of the International Space Station, but also extremely similar to the decommissioned Mir station that the Soviet Union used to run a few decades back. And pretty much most of the technology used in Mir station is now being to some extent reused in the Chinese space station, with a lot more advances and a lot more features added. With a total mass of about 80 to 100 ton, this is actually going to be a really, really massive object orbiting in space. And it's going to be in a relatively similar altitude of about 400 kilometers above the ground. And pretty much all of the parameters of the station and all of the missions planned are sort of built on the previous experience with the two uh, stations that China had before. The much smaller stations known as Tiangong 1, which orbited uh, Earth for about 7 years and the identical Tiangong-2 that stayed in orbit for about 3 years and was decommissioned back in 2019. But unlike those previous stations, just like Mir here, this one is going to be modular and it's going to be possible to maintain and to change the orbit of that station, making it a relatively long mission. But here the first question is, so why? Why are they doing this? Why can't they just use ISS, or even better, buy the ISS from NASA that doesn't really want it anymore? Well, one of the main reasons is because a long time ago NASA decided that collaboration and cooperation with China is going to be impossible. So they're actually not allowed on the International Space Station. Pretty much every other nationality is allowed, but not China. And so pretty much most of the technology in this particular space station is essentially coming from the purchase of various technologies from Russia back in 1994, combined with previous collaborations back in the 50s between Soviet Union and Communist China. Over time, China ended up buying a lot of hardware from Russia as well, and eventually was able to reverse engineer all of the parts required to maintain and to have a modular space station very similar to the Soviet Mir station. Now, this first part, known as Tianhe, essentially contains life support, living quarters for three people, and also has guidance and navigation systems on the inside. The following modules, Meng Tian and Wen Tian, are essentially going to be laboratories. These are going to be experimental uh, locations for various scientific experiments in uh, zero gravity. This part in front, known as Tiang Zhao, that's basically the return module that the astronauts are going to use to return back to planet Earth, with another similar craft on the other side, the craft you see right here, known as Shen Zhao. Although interestingly, unlike the International Space Station, this particular space station is also going to have this other module or craft the craft you see right here known as Zhongtiang, orbiting in a really similar position to the space station and will also be able to dock with the station once in a while. And this right here is really cool because this is expected to be something that's about 300 times more powerful than Hubble telescope. So in other words, China is creating a kind of a modular international space station mixed with Hubble telescope. And that sounds kind of cool. And they're sort of taking a lot of lessons from other space stations as well. They're even going to have their own version of Canadarm, something that my country is very proud of. But apparently they're going to have their own thing and it's probably going to be very similar to what you see here. And interestingly, just like the Soviet Mir station, everything here will be automatically assembled in space. All of the docking will be automatic as well, which is slightly different from how the US part of International Space Station was put in place. A lot of the things had to be assembled and connected by sending astronauts using space shuttle and by having them essentially assemble things uh, manually. In contrast, the Chinese mission, just like the Soviet mission, is going to just send the pre-built modules which will then connect kind of like Lego pieces. But to build this, they need to launch 10 more rockets. And at least two of these rockets are going to have very similar profiles, which means that there are potentially going to be two more pieces tumbling to planet Earth. It's not entirely clear how the other launches are going to be different, but they too might have pieces falling to the planet, creating a potential political disaster if those pieces crash somewhere really important. And we know that these missions are all very likely a go, with 12 astronauts already in training to be launched sometime in approximately two years from now. And so, in some sense, it's definitely interesting to see where China takes this, but at the same time, it's a little bit worrisome to actually expect more pieces to fall to planet Earth without an actual controlled descent like a typical rocket would have. And to be honest, I am actually super excited about their version of the Hubble telescope. It's going to be powerful enough to take incredible pictures and it's probably going to provide a lot of beautiful imagery. But for now, we don't really know much else about the mission. Okay, we know that it's probably going to last maybe 10 to potentially 12 years. 
would be very likely retirement after 15 years. And we also know that the naming convention for all of these modules is very different from the way that things are named in Soviet Union slash Russia or in the US. Unlike these somewhat idealistic names that Soviet Union used to give to its rockets, this is for example known as the World, also known as Peace. And a lot of these different modules here have names like the Dawn or the East, which sometimes represents the idea of hope. Or unlike the American missions, which normally tend to give them more Greek mythology names, Apollo, Artemis, and so on. In this particular case, the Chinese uh, scientists or the Chinese uh, rocket engineers tend to name their rockets after Chinese mythology. So we have the center here, this is the Harmony of Heavens. We have this part known as the Dream of Heavens, this part known as the Quest for Heavens, and this right here is the Exploration of Heavens. And that's of course from the Chinese mythology where the heavens represent a really big part of the mythology itself. And so interestingly here they chose names that have this very vivid imagery that represent very specific things. And that only has one purpose, to basically encourage the public, to encourage the future generation of scientists, and to most importantly also increase national pride and national cohesion. And I think they've been doing a pretty good job at that. But I guess other than that we don't know much else about the mission just yet. We'll know more in about three years. And I guess we're going to find out soon where this piece lands, but until this happens or until there are new developments coming from the Chinese mission, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.